Enterprise DDD. Um, sounds sexy, right? So the title is a little bit different, Designing Business Process and Customer Journeys. I removed the word better because it was uh, a bit presumptuous. Um, thank you very much to the organizers. I'm having a blast and I hope you do too. I met awesome people yesterday. Uh, I'm Francois, Francois Royer, uh, Guanxi Labs, but the easiest way to reach me if you have questions or ideas, things to uh, bounce off, uh, it's uh, easy on Twitter, Francois Royer. So, quick word about me, I am not a software developer, I'm sorry, uh, not even trained in computer science, even later, I'm a biologist uh, by training, so I love systems complex systems. Uh, I've got an academic background. I spent 12 years in the space industry where I was told that uh, I was doing a soft science, you know, based on data and statistics, uh, not the really cool core primitives of uh, physics and math. So, okay, fine. Uh, learned a lot. It was really fun. Uh, started a startup, big data and AI startup in 2012. Uh, grew it for four years and then sold it to a small consulting firm called PwC. Um, I've heard about it where I learned and discovered the world of consulting, uh, which is the uh, topic of this presentation. I uh, left them over the summer. I started another uh, strategy and IT consulting firm called Guanxi Labs, and I'm helping a few companies, uh, product companies, get off the ground. So, that's me. What are we going to talk about? Tools and processes and things from the other side, from the business side, okay? Where, uh, basically, they wear different um, dress code, they have suits, they speak in different terms. But you'll see it's not that different. So I've gathered a few uh, fun facts and stories and concepts and tools from, from the business toolbox. And the idea is to basically compare them with, uh, so to speak, ours. Okay, what we thought uh, would be interesting uh, in the software community. So uh, it's not an exhaustive list, uh, but I think it's a good start. It's going to give you some pointers if you are if interested. Fun stuff. I'll be making a few claims and proposition. Whenever you see a big black screen like this, uh, that's me making a claim or proposition. It might be wrong, it might be right. It doesn't really matter. Uh, first one, first claim. Now is a good time for enterprise DDD. Put enterprise in quotes. Uh, why? Enterprise, uh, there's many different definitions. Uh, mine is whenever the dynamics of people and legacy and silos basically are become more important in driving the business than anything technical, okay, anything rational. So even a startup could be uh, a So, um, quick poll, um, who knows the revenue of their company? Okay, not that many hands. Who uh, has turnover and revenue of more than 25 million? Okay, that would be the metal stand. So, startups, the other ones? Okay, awesome. Um, let's start looking inwards. Uh, DDD within the enterprise, okay, within the boundary. So, not that much like dealing with the end customers, the, the, the real paying clients, the, the people that basically contribute to that turnover we just talked about, but like all the messy processes within the buckets, within the, uh, the boxes of the enterprise. So let's do what uh, consultants do. They love to frame the problem. They like a highly structured view of, uh, of the question, okay? We call that evolving in a problem space instead of jumping to the solution space. Engineers love to be in the solution space. Consultants love to be in the problem space and asking questions. And they get a lot of money for that. Let's frame the problem. I believe that most of our issues uh, in the software community comes from this opposition of the us versus them. Us, we know who that, who that is, that's us. Them is everyone else, not just business, but all the supporting functions, all these different departments that we don't really understand. They don't, they don't, they don't work in the same building. They don't dress the same way. They don't speak the same way. They are not paid the same. Okay, they don't have the same customers. Everything is different. 
if you didn't go to the same school. Okay, that's a lot of differences. Okay, so how can you imagine to build a common language? Okay, a shared understanding of things, of concepts, of who we work for, if we don't have also mutual respect. Okay, it's really hard to respect the other party if you don't understand them. Okay, so I think that's the root uh, of it all. If we don't want to be seen as expensive typists, yeah, we're very expensive typists. We are on the keyboard all the time, and we have black screens, and we, we put out a code and letters. We're expensive typists. But on the other side, we see business people basically handling, having a handling of, of a language that we don't even know. Nobody taught us. Who has an MBA here? Who went to business school? We can talk. Um, are you recovering business people and going to software, or are you talking in between? I don't know. We'll talk about it. So hopefully you'll have fun with this uh, presentation. So I think the core of the problem is the us and them. Um, it's not just things that we learn at business school, okay, that, that uh, baggage of theory and concepts and tools that we are given. C-level, okay, higher up in the companies, are heavily influenced by serious business firms, serious uh, consulting firms. Okay, so you must be familiar with these, uh, these guys. Uh, to the left, you have the MBBs, okay, the, uh, uh, the pure uh, player strategy firms. You get McKinsey, uh, BCG. BCG was one of the first, I think the first. Bain, very discreet. For a few years, we didn't even uh, carry uh, business cards. Okay, so you don't even know uh, if uh, <laughs> your company had hired uh, Bain and Co. And to the right, the big fours. Um, more well known because they come from audit, legal services, accountants. Okay, and they grew and grew and grew uh, because of their uh, basically customer uh, uh, base, which was absolutely massive. Okay, they, between the four, they basically corner the entire market. Um, they're global, and they basically are moving also into the uh, advisory. Um, uh, and a strategy uh, business in between scandals, if you've been following the news. Okay? So they come with their own language, their own set of tools that, that they have been refining, so we can uh, dive in a little bit. So let's take a page from our own book, DDD, and focus on a common language or a mapping. Okay, let's, let's, see, let's see what's best. What's that, by the way? Rosetta Stone, yes, thank you. Um, so let's try to see if we can build our own Rosetta Stone, or at least a mapping between tools of like, hardcore strategy and business consulting and the software world. Let's see if it's possible. And use the other party's words and language against them, because we understand it. Or do the opposite, like corporate jujitsu. OK, let's not fight them. Let's play with them. But first, as good DDD practitioners, we should start to agree on some definitions or see how much we disagree. Okay? So let's start with a concept uh, that we've all heard, I'm sure, at school or during uh, meetings. The value chain. Everyone has heard about the value chain? Majority, but not everyone. Okay, I didn't know what it was. I was a biologist. We don't talk about value, okay? You talk about metabolic pathways, ecosystems, okay? Isotopes, things like this. Um, according to business, so business trained people, am I right? The value, the value chain as uh, taught in business school, it's the definition of Porter, 1985. Brilliant professor of strategy and business, okay? Most of the time, when you talk about the value chain in a business setup, everyone will have this big matrix or set of blocks. It looks like an arrow, okay, to the right, uh, in mind. That's the value chain according to business. Is it really a chain? Well, not really, okay? It's not uh, that obvious for an engineer to look at it. First of all, uh, the customer is not there, it's to the right, okay? Seems obvious. 
but basically it's the one uh, of, uh, from which we extract the margin, extract the margin, okay? They pay for the value plus the cost uh, of operating all this to the left. So what is this to the left? You got two main building blocks, the support activities to the top, okay? These are all the uh, HR management, legal services, uh, strategy, uh, core IT, and procurement, okay? the lifeblood of the company. And they support what? They support the primary activities, okay, at the bottom. That's a very old school view of manufacturing, okay? We buy goods, transform them, add our secret sauce, re-engineer them, reassemble them. That's inbound logistics and operations, that's manufacturing. And then outbound logistics is distribution, putting the hand in the hands of the customers what we have just built and supported, of course, in the meantime, by procurement, because you buy machines, you buy the goods, etc. you order them, the people that are behind it, engineers, technicians, etc., etc. marketing and sales, so that our customers, our beloved customers, know about what we sell and the value that hopefully it has, and sales, showing it on the throat of our customers, and service, after sales, maintenance, okay, customer success. You could actually take this exact value chain diagram and turn it into uh, the SaaS value chain if you are in the business of uh, building and selling a SaaS, a software as a service, okay? With the demand side and the supply side. Fine. Um, DDD experts here, I'm sure you've already done the mapping between primary activities and... Core domains, thank you. Support activities and? <laughs> exactly. It's not that hard, right? Great. I think we have an almost one-to-one -one mapping between uh, our concepts. Okay, these are domains. Excellent. That's a good start. Okay. Now, what would Simon Wardley do? Wardley Maps. Who has heard about them? Yeah, if you've been following Twitter, there's a, like, a lot of activity in there. Um, long story short, um, I'm not here to talk, uh, talk about worldly maps, just have a couple of slides on them, but do follow this guy. He has a grand plan of like, distributing this way of doing strategy and putting it in the hand of engineers because he's doing literally strategy and value chain for geeks, for engineers, for hackers like us, with a much sounder way of representing basically the dependencies between the end value component that we're putting in the hands of the customer and basically everything that, that is needed down the value chain, okay? So the value chain axis is now a dimension. It's not, it's not anymore a concept, okay? It's now a dimension that you can order. And the further away you are from the customer, the further up you are in the value chain, the further away you are, okay? And he added a little access at the bottom about the evolution, okay? I'm doing custom stuff, very expensive stuff, not guaranteed stuff, R&D stuff to the left, okay? Or are you buying something like a commodity? So you can actually map your entire stack on, for example, on-premise versus cloud offerings, okay? To an engineer, I think it's much more appealing, okay? Do look at it. Everything is in Creative Commons. Now, let's go deeper. Um, that was just like one facet of an interesting concept, the value chain. Uh, let's look further into the strategy consultant's toolbox. And we're talking about the hardcore strategists, okay? The people that were on the left, the MBBs, McKinsey, BCG, uh, when they have a little bit of downtime, which is not often, uh, they work nine and days, uh, they actually co come up with tools that are actually PowerPoint templates, okay? When a consultant tells you, I have a tool, it's usually a, a very complex PowerPoint or Excel template. But this is a tool, okay? That's what it looks like. Uh, very visual, I like it. You must surely have seen these kind of diagrams in strategy presentations by top management, okay? Um, circles surrounding other circles. Uh, the adoption curve, the Gaussian curve, okay? Usually not that Gaussian, but how oh well. Uh, SWOT matrices. Everyone heard about SWOT matrices? Okay. 
strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats. Um, great to basically map out things. I still have nightmares about them because I don't know what to put in these uh, boxes. Uh, very talented strategy consultants can do it in like five minutes. I can't. Um, value driver trees, uh, that I know how to do well, maybe because I like to break things apart. Uh, value driver trees are very interesting. We'll, uh, we'll have a look uh, at them later. The PCG matrix in green, of course, because it comes from BCG. Uh, that is really nice. We're going to uh, try it, uh, test uh, trial it um, against uh, wildly maps. So that's the kind of tools. Very visual, uh, usually simple, two-dimensional, couple of trees. Um, and all of them follow the same principle. That comes from McKinsey. Um, if you were to work at McKinsey, and anyone has worked or for McKinsey or with McKinsey? Usually it's not a good sign because they had, you know, management cut um, a lot of the workforce. So anyway, if you were to work at this kind of uh, firm, they would ask you constantly, you are a junior analyst or a consultant, is your analysis MISI? MISI stands for mutually exclusive and collectively exhaustive. Okay, have you deconstructed the problem into a set of parts that collectively cover the entire problem, but with no overlap. Okay, so they're really uh, into that. So you could, for example, decompose a taco, deconstruct a taco into its mean, not meat, combinations, etc. Uh, as constituents, they love that. Let's look at the BCG matrix and see that it's not that actually completely alien. Um, somebody thought that putting the x-axis on top was a good idea. I have no idea why. But anyway, uh, this is the relative market share of a product that you have okay, in your own portfolio. So uh, high market share to the left, uh, smaller market shares to the right. Uh, and the y-axis is the growth rate. Are we in a low uh, uh, or zero growth rate? Are we in a high growth rate? So simply put, if you have a very big market share, but a uh, low growth rate, you have what we call a cash cow. Okay, that's very easy. So something that brings a ton of money and that you have to protect. So the BCG matrix is all about understanding how to invest, how to divest, and how to protect. Okay, um, it's, uh, it's quite commonly used. It looks simple, looks like a bit of a Lego, but it works. Uh, high growth rate, uh, high market share, that's your star product, okay? So, of course, put, uh, bet the company uh, on it. And dogs, <laughs> uh, small market share, low growth rate, you have to divest, okay? So, you can start actually thinking about movement, okay? For those of you who have uh, heard about worldly maps, that's basically what, uh, what uh, the BCG uh, metric is, is here for. Dogs, you divest. Cash cow produce a, lo a lot of cash, uh, a lot of turnover and profit margin that you can invest into the bets, okay, which are on the top right, uh, startups, uh, uh, new, new product launches, etc., etc. Worldly maps are exactly about that. Okay, um, please do uh, look at uh, Simon Wiley's book on, on, on Medium, but it's actually exactly about that, is how are you going to invest so that you move the needle of core components of whatever product or service you have built uh, and you are offering to your customers? How do you escape competition and anticipate a future where you'll be a leader? By moving things from left to right, cost money. Okay? At first, you will have, for example, a custom ERP because you think your business is uh, so different than the others that you cannot buy something off the shelf. Well, today, in 2019 and 2020, uh, you can have, I'm sure, an ERP that maps exactly uh, onto your needs. So instead of doing the make or buy dance, just rent it. Okay? So that's what worldly maps uh, are about, moving things to the right uh, to uh, escape competition. Not that different from the BCG matrix, right? But I think a more a sounder way of thinking about, about things. It's a graph, it's a map, and the uh, axis basically uh, can be made quantitatively 
sound. You can rank things, okay, with a nice sigmoid functions and, and, and see how you're going to organize and compare components, okay? For the engineer, it's way more appealing. So it's not that different, actually. It's just that uh, we don't really speak the same language. We don't have similar tools, but we don't slap them with the same vocabularies. And we have different points of reference. That's my first proposition. And started from zero. And of course, we count from zero. Business people uh, find that really, uh, really annoying. Okay. But we're not that different. So, the question is, how can DDD help in creating more alignment? Okay, top management loves alignment, because they know their troops think the same way. Okay, are focused on the same end customers. They love that. And a shared language, a shared understanding is all about alignment. Okay, second proposition. You just said it, every activity in the enterprise value chain defines a domain. Okay, that's the start. Okay, you can basically expose that to, uh, uh, to your business counterparts. That's quite easy. Okay, it was obvious to us. We can basically say we have the same vocabulary. Okay, for the same thing. So every activity in the value chain is a domain. That's absolutely fine. Okay, is that enough? I got a big problem with that right now, actually. A domain doesn't define activities. What is really core is what we are doing within these activities. The languages we have for the tasks and activities inside a bucket. Okay? Um, business tends to agree. The biggest problem right now is to break down the silo and make sure everyone works together. The support functions are not working for themselves. The support functions, the support domains, are working for all the core ones. So we are missing links, linkages, okay? Perfect, we're making progress. If you want to describe the company, it's not just about buckets, but also about linkages and flows, physical goods, and people, okay? Uh, financial flows, cash, transactions sometimes, uh, and data, information. Information is paramount, okay? It's not just a linear uh, flow of cash and, uh, uh, and goods, because there is a fundamental activity for all companies, especially manufacturing, for example, planning. Okay, how am I planning the workforce for the next year? How am I going to incentivize and, and, and scale my sales force uh, to uh, capture basically the demand of the market? Okay, and then how do I make sure that I smooth that demand? so that my limited manufacturing capabilities is not flooded with massive orders, okay? And I can't fulfill it, and I get penalties, or I lose customers. So planning, flow of information are paramount. And then you have to get interested into how the information flows. Is it two ways, okay? Is it a discussion, is it an interaction for planning? Yes. Or is it just like fire and forget, I send a domain event, okay? The thing has been delivered or the order has been accepted, things like this. So that's our new framework. And uh, that's another proposition, but I think it's universally accepted. Uh, it's not about the components, it's about how well uh, the components work together, and a company will only function as well as the connections and the links uh, between, between them, between the core and supporting domains. And uh, in business, and I'm sure you've heard about it, uh, they came up with a lot of fancy ways to make sure things work well, okay? With the, 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 the right lubricant. That lubricant is called the business process, okay? That one is for support function. Procure to pay, order to cash. Procure to pay is on the buy side, okay? You buy things or people, uh, and basically you send a purchase order procure, through procurement, and you have to follow this process all the way until the supplier is paid, okay? That's the process. Same thing happens when you sell something, the thing that you have manufactured, to your client. It's called order to cash or quote to cash. Everyone has heard about them, these processes? Ripe for DDD. Except that there's already people in place. And it's a support function. It's essential, but it's not core, okay? We just said it. 
This is not core. It's all about the process. But there's different kinds of process. Support, core, and business is extremely well aware of it and sees as the whole thing as something to be optimized, okay? No innovation, something to really, really be optimized. And that has happened for a while. I'm opening like uh, um, a little uh, uh, sidetrack here for process or uh, business management archaeology uh, with PERT. It stands for Program Evolution and Review Technique. It's really old, uh, started in the 50s. Who's heard about it? PERT. Sort of hand uh, here. Uh, it's still in use. Yep, that's for project. Uh, started in the Navy when they started thinking about putting uh, basically really bad things, uh, nuclear weapons uh, on the, in the head of missiles to basically lob it uh, to, uh, to other countries. Uh, but they were able to deliver on time and on budget an $11 billion at a time uh, uh, project. So basically, pe some people think that PERT was the actually, <laughs> actually the best outcome of that, uh, of that project and got taught in business school for um, ever. It was used to plan Olympic Games, uh, crazy things like this. And it's actually really formal, okay? It's business, but as engineers, you'll see that uh, at its core, it's just a set of states, okay, places, uh, and um, uh, links between these different steps with costs, okay, in terms of days, in terms of uh, uh, financial costs, etc. And uh, you can reason about it. It's a graph. It's cool. We can reason about it. We can extract domain knowledge from that. Okay, if you have a documented process, you could interview someone, or you could actually look at it and very easily extract the steps uh, of this state machine. It's actually not a state machine, so Petri net, but anyway. And um, fun fact, if you've ever heard you are on a critical path, Everyone knows about the critical path? How about it? Okay, that comes from PERT. Blame PERT for that. Why is that? The critical path is the one that takes the longest and consumes the most resources. Okay? If you were to do a, a not shortest path, but longest path in that directed graph, the longest path, according to all the costs in terms of time uh, and finance, is the critical path. Okay? It's not the most important, but it's the one that will have the most impact in the delivery of the final system. Blame Pert for that. OK, um, that's all. That's project. Let's talk about more digital stuff, more modern stuff. Uh, it's the business process, BPM. Who has heard about BPM? Almost everyone. OK, in a good way? OK, people are laughing. Um, I love that stuff. I hate them too. Why is that? It's because there is so much information, okay? As consultants, most of the time you receive hundreds, literally hundreds of documents, usually five days before the engagement, and you have to absorb it, okay, with the entire business of the client, so that the first workshops are actually like high impact, targeted and focused, uh, value delivering uh, uh, workshops, okay? Cue the buzzwords. So you have to sometimes eat up that kind of stuff. I like it because most of the time, uh, it's easy to have an overview of the process. Okay, so you know what it's about. Um, now, don't forget, it's a notation, BPMN, okay? Business Process Model Notation, okay? It's an exchange document. It was not meant to be executable, okay? People are laughing. It was not meant to be executable, but fourth point, many engines e exist to basically execute your BPM. Aha, so that means that thing is being executed somewhere. There's code, it's in prod, yes. Okay, does it match the design document? We don't know. Okay, um, some companies are really good at actually executing the spec. If you are in a highly regulated environment like banks, etc., most of the time they make sure that what is described is what is in prod because audits, okay? And it's much easier to audit this than zeros and ones and make sure that you have a chain uh, that uh, guarantees that whatever version of this 
is described is also in production. So not everything is equal. Um, there are nice things that we can extract from uh, BPM documents. Uh, there's a lot of very DDD friendly concepts in there, like actors, subdomains, swim lanes, okay? Who, whoever has been to the event modeling uh, workshop of Adam basically has seen that, okay? He simply took the swim lanes uh, business process uh, concept uh, and applied it to, to DDD, which, uh, which I think is a, is a good idea. Um, and also, there's many things that are not that far from what we do, uh, like events, okay? Start events, the end events, all the events in between, events due to the passage of time. If you've been doing event storming, okay, at your company or, or with clients, um, you basically have sort of a one-to-one -one mapping. That's great. You got tasks, okay? Could be long-running tasks, sagas, comments. That maps well too. Um, and then you have more complex stuff. Business process is actually a very complex uh, 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 language. We are at uh, version two right now, and it introduces a lot of little symbols that uh, practitioners that can decipher. I can't decipher all of them, uh, but basically, you almost have a joint complete language. Uh, you have forks and joints, etc. Things that are much harder to define in event modeling, okay? Things that are harder also to identify in event storming, things like this. Ah, interesting, do we have an advantage here to, to BPM? Well, not really, you'll see why. Um, these have been designed by committee and now the target of BPM is actually the execution. It used to be great when it was something to think about, now more and more, uh, designing the process is all about making sure it goes in prod as is, okay? So we have a problem, why is that? Because that's a black hole, okay? That's an absolute sink. You don't have a two-way, uh, basically, gateway between uh, the design of PPM and execution. Oh, and by the way, all these editors support different versions or more or less advanced versions of their own BPMN, okay? Fragmentation. You as developer basically are losing your power, the power of expressivity, of expressing things. You become a configurator, okay? Fine. You're the CEO. You're supposed to basically try to understand the strengths and weaknesses of PPM and DDD, okay? Uh, knowing that they have different targets, they have way less open targets uh, if, you're, if you're a BPM. What are you going to do? Well, another proposition is BPM is about non-core supporting business activities, right? Because they are well known, they shouldn't change that much. They can be designed by committee, okay? They might not need the level of interaction of DDD practitioners, even storming, okay, the kind of discussion that you need to have to basically construct core things, which are about the customer. We don't really know the customer. We don't know his or her own, her own uh, value chain. Okay? So BPM is actually a fantastic tool for supporting activities. Okay? And DDD should be concentrated in um, uh, core activities. And you'll avoid also a world of pain. Now, um, so yeah, BPM, uh, that's reality. Let's uh, go back to uh, what hap actually happens in practice. Uh, BPM, because basically, why not? You have acquired already a big solution from vendors. BPM has actually started contaminating core activities, okay? It's everywhere. Of course, it's a sunk cost. We have this engine, okay? We know how to do it. We have trained people, 10, hundreds of people in BPM. So why not, do, why not apply it everywhere? I think that's a problem. Oh, and you're fighting also vendors who love to have the sales strategy of lending and expanding, okay? You first start with support activities and then you can convince other, other parties uh, at the clients that basically your solution is good and basically should be embedded everywhere. And boom, you have BPM everywhere. So, TDD to the rescue. Um, Let's start with reverse engineering. 
You can identify where BPM has basically started contaminating things and is not giving the flexibility it should have or the scalability. Okay, go try deploying at scale uh, some BPM engine on Kubernetes or whatever. You have a scalability problem or you cannot iterate fast enough. The vendor is not uh, going fast enough. Your first task is to identify these processes and reverse engineering them. Can we do that? Can we turn uh, BPM into an event model? I think the answer is yes. Um, that's, uh, that's courtesy of uh, Beto Brandolini. It's basically the event model, uh, the more complex version with comments that you can accept or not based on the state. Okay, the aggregate is about the state and you emit or not the main event to which other components will subscribe. Okay, this is a really asynchronous event-based model. BPM does not talk about this. You can have a synchronicity, you can have time-based things, you can, have, you can exchange documents, but it's not really about that. So you have to really understand the differences between the two. BPM is about tasks and documents and activities, this and that, it's about order. Um, event storming, for example, is about the flow of events and the naming. BPM pathways are explicit. You can have loops and branches. Uh, in event storming workshops, usually, uh, I think we're good at doing happy paths. It's harder to, uh, to build uh, all the different other pathways that BPM is good at. Uh, data is more explicit. As I said, also, BPM is committee-oriented. We do it once, uh, deploy it, done. Uh, events and DDs are more about the discussions and the workshop and uh, acquiring and sharing the knowledge. And of course, uh, in terms of artifacts, BPM, if it's not well done, you can uh, execute it. Event storming, not so much. Okay. We might need something better than just a comparison because the mapping might be extremely complex to build, but maybe an intermediary representation. Proposition. Most of the BPM engines um, actually uh, do not execute directly, but they have an intermediary representation based on Petri-nets. Who knows about Petri-nets? Yeah, computer science. Okay, who likes them? Okay. Yeah, they're super hard to manipulate, actually. They're fantastic because they have a formal representation of the workflow, and they have properties that you can verify. Okay, homogeneity, completeness. Things like this, reachability, I like them. Um, turns out, uh, we went through the, the literature, that it's quite, actually quite easy to uh, do what the, these BPM and engines do and translate a BPM into a Petri net, okay? A Petri net is all about uh, places that hold tokens, value, an entity, an event, and a transition. A transition becomes active if both its inputs, mapped by the place and the links, basically are satisfied with something in it. That's a function. Okay? That's a command. It's actually <coughs> not that hard to see the bridge between the two. Now, imagine the outcome of your event storming workshop or your event model. It maps almost went to went to a patronet. That's why a patronet sh should be probably a candidate intermediary representation, instead of doing a mapping between events and DDD and BPM, let's target that as the intermediary representation. Okay? Yeah, formal methods. Actually, we did study Petronets because we use them in biology. So it's not just soft science. Um, so we've been working on, uh, on that, uh, that little idea to turn this, post-its, into that. Okay? executable Petrinet with the actual uh, PMN uh, language and representation. Okay, we're working, uh, working on that. So, um, little, uh, little push for these guys, the company in Toulouse, we are actually trying to build the engine. Okay, uh, it's a little AI engine, a uh, little machine learning prologue based thing uh, that basically turns uh, your post-its uh, into an actual formally executable uh, uh, computer, uh, computer graph. It's still in beta, so uh, check it out 
follow them and see, uh, see what comes out. OK. Now the real hard question. OK, the one that basically every consultant dreads. What you just described, the document you just gave me, uh, is it in production? Well, not really. OK, fine. Who do I ask? Well, we don't know. Uh, or he's gone, or she's gone. Okay, the real core of the problem is about that, uh, in practice, uh, you don't have what corresponds to the theory, to the design documents. Ten minutes, thank you. Um, so another proposition, uh, diving a bit deeper in the components of, of, of DDD, uh, the event log is the actual true representation of the process. The reality is the true representation of the process. So you have to uh, look for it, okay? Don't forget that BPM was something designed by a committee, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Okay, more goodies, more vendors and editors. A lot of people realize that, okay? That there's a difference between designing the process and actually executing it. So there's a big companies, uh, also SAP and Oracle and smaller-ish company that have been pushing log analysis systems, okay, with a lot of hardcore theory behind it, that basically compare the theory, the, de the process as designed, nice linear, okay, uh, B should uh, happen after A, uh, the customer should be invoiced only after delivering something, the supplier should be invoiced only after the goods have been delivered, or well, you should see the number of uh, accounts uh, payable uh, departments that basically pay their suppliers sometimes before everything has been received, you know, and sometimes most of the time in batch uh, at the end of the year for some reason. So the reality is basically reentrant processes, and you can infer that from logs. So just giving you uh, this pointer, uh, these companies are doing that. It's super easy to actually plug uh, uh, a little export script into audit logs of ERPs, so you can actually look at the different steps. These are your events. You can basically automatically start building your events from the event log of the systems, and these guys have clearly understood it. Okay, uh, just have a few minutes. The same thing happens with the outward uh, battle, the future battle, which is customer experience, customer journeys. This is the thing for digital transformation. Exactly the same thing happens. Why is that? Because when we started looking into the actual wants and needs of the customer, uh, business and, and everyone brought their ways of, of structuring things, organizing things to uh, the customer value approach. And digital leaders, the ones that are really good at orchestrating touch points, basically are the ones that are better at sharing internally who's the customer, their needs, the different touch points, and how they interact until they buy, or even better, renew uh, the subscription, for example. So, basic, pretty bad uh, customer journeys look like this. Don't really know what to make of it. It's really ordered, really, really linear, as if you or I uh, are buying, for example, a plane ticket like this. No, I don't become aware of Air France or Lufthansa, and then uh, go into consideration. No, I go straight to portals. That's bad. That's more like it. That's more like it. That's a bit better. Um, there's still the linear view. Uh, what you should imagine is basically all the jumps of the customer back and forth. Okay, it's really it's really a messy graph. But what I really like in that kind of more advanced customer journey maps, and there's a lot of uh, uh, consulting companies that do it. Uh, what I really like is that it shows you who is concerned. Remember the swim lanes? Okay, that's very interesting. The touch points uh, that expose uh, data acquisitions or the commands, the actions, the side effects uh, on your app or website, basically it's someone's responsibility. It's going to emit, emit an event in somebody's turf, in somebody's domain, okay? And they have to act on it, okay? Either automatically or uh, uh, through a, a manual process. These customer journey maps, if you are a consultant or work in uh, UX-focused uh, companies, 
they are gold. If you can find them, they are gold. So once again, it's a design. Doesn't mean it's reality. Okay? So go look at the logs. And it's all about understanding what the customer actually wants. We talked about value chain internally, how it's basically delivered also to the customer. Last tool, and then you're free, it's all about the jobs to be done framework. Consultants love that too. Who knows about the jobs to be done? Couple free. Okay, you're in for a treat. It's really fun. Uh, taught a lot in design schools and business schools, and it's all about building the value chain, everything we have been doing, but in the mind of the customer. Why do I buy a drill? It's not to make holes. It's to hang a frame, so my place looks beautiful. Okay? Consultants love that. But basically, everything we've been saying, you can do it for the customer. And all of a sudden, customer journeys and your processes become way easier to do. And I think I'm good. And last proposition that sums up, there's always a difference between what is observed and what is designed. So maybe a proposition about domain-driven design. Uh, this should have the counterpart about the, observ the observed part, the learning part. Okay? Let's do domain-driven machine learning. Domain-driven statistics. Just a thought. Thank you. For me.